Amen. Please be seated. What a great time worshiping the Lord this morning. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to invite you to turn to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. We're going to be looking at verses 16 through 28 of Hebrews chapter 9 today. And today we're going to start out a little bit different. I know this is a Baptist church and we don't do things differently around here, but today we are. Uh, Today we're going to open up in prayer and then we're going to uh, dive into God's word from that. So would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Father God, we come before you this morning, Lord. Uh, Lord, you're holy, you're worthy, you're the one true God. Father, we come before you this morning. We just uh, have prepared our hearts and minds to hear a word from you today. So, God, I just pray that this would be a word directly from you. Father, I pray for us as a body of believers here today that we would be tuned in and focused on you. Father, I pray that you'd speak to us through your word, through your Holy Spirit, and through Jesus, your Son. Father, today, if there's someone here who doesn't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, today would be the day and this would be the hour that they would give their life to Christ. Lord, just help us as we worship you that we would be pleasing to you. This is about you, God, and we're here for you. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today is a special day. Today is the day that we remember my mom's birthday. And I don't know that I have liberty to say exactly how old she is, and that's between her and God. But I do know this. Rob would say it's not a birthday, it's an anniversary of the birth of your yourself. So you can take that up with Rob. But today I can say pretty emphatically that if it wasn't for my mom, I wouldn't be here today. And I can tell you this, the other day, I'm blessed to have uh, godly parents. And so we celebrate her birthday today. And and even last night we got to celebrate that. This week I was uh, at the church and uh, and Merle and, and Jerry were outside uh, working on the marquee. And I don't know if anybody's driven by the last couple of evenings when the sun goes down, but they, um, they were working on the sign and they've they got it halfway done. To the best of their ability, we're waiting on a ballast, but uh, the sign is lit once again. And so we thank them for that. And I was out there and Merle and Jerry was working on it and you put them two together, you got quite a crew. <laughs> but it's a fun crew, I can tell you that. So I was out there talking with them and uh, it was about 1230 and I was getting kind of antsy because I had an appointment, a divine appointment to be at. Uh, At 1230, I was a half hour late to sitting down at my mom's dinner table for lunch. And you know, they was making fun of me. Jerry made fun of me. You know, he made fun of me. He he said, where are you going down to your mom's for lunch? And I said, you better believe it. Uh, You know, my mama didn't raise no fool. If I'm invited for lunch, I'm coming. And so, uh, anyway, I went down, and, and, and it was an invitation that she gave me to, to join her and Dad at the, at the table, and I loved that. Well, today, we're invited to sit down and partake in another table. It's called the Lord's Table, as you see here behind me. And, and the Lord's Table is not an invitation that anybody here on this earth can give us. It's an invitation from God. And so today, we're going to absor- observe the Lord's Supper here in just a little while. But I can tell you the honest truth today. If it wasn't for Jesus, I wouldn't be here today. If it wasn't for Christ, we would have no reason to be here today. If it wasn't for Christ and His blood that He shed on the cross, His death, His burial, His resurrection, we would have no reason to gather at this table today. But because of Jesus, because of the blood of Christ, we can gather at this table and we remember Him and what He's done for each of us and, and, and the life that He's given to us. You know, today we're reminded of this, and, I, and this, this is what I want you to get right off the bat. God's righteous requirements for our sin was the blood of Jesus. God's righteous requirements for our sin, each and every one of us, our sin, there was a penalty for that, and, and His requirement led to Jesus bleeding and dying for us on the cross. So, when we think about the Lord's Supper, and we think about all that Christ has done... We talk about the blood of Jesus, and we sing about the blood of Jesus, and and what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. There is power in the blood of Jesus. We have victory in Jesus. He sought me and bought me with His redeeming blood. Amen? Praise God. And that's why we're here today. 
God's righteous requirement for our sin was the blood of Jesus. But Jesus washed that away. The power of the blood, the victory that we have in Him today. So today, before we partake of this Lord's Supper, I want to talk about the blood of Jesus. And, and, and just, just Joe Springer saw it in the bulletin as he's printing it, and he said, I am getting excited just because it says the blood. Amen. And that should excite us today. You see, the blood sacrifice of Jesus is what we're going to talk about today. The blood sacrifice of Jesus, here's what we need to know. First of all, it was intentional. It was intentional. Do you know he meant to do that? A lot of times we look at Scripture and we look at things and, and, and we wonder, was that by accident? Was that by coincidence? I can tell you today, the blood of Jesus, him dying on the cross was intentional. You know, a lot of times in our life, we ask the question, did they do that on purpose? Have you ever asked that question? Did they do that on purpose? We gathered down at mom and dad's last night and we were out back playing and, and six grandsons were out there playing. And every time you turned around, we'd be in a conversation and they would run up and one of them would be bawling. <laughs> They'd be bawling and what happened now? Well, he, he hit me. Well, was it on accident? Was it a coincidence? Or was it on purpose? That's what we have to determine. Now, now one time, Owen came running up to Tom... It wasn't Owen, it was Tucker. What happened, Tucker? I get hit in the head, Owen hit me in the head with a baseball bat. Now, it was, it was a wiffle ball bat, it wasn't a, wasn't a hard bat. Well, it was hard enough, I'm sure. But he, he said, well, Owen, did you hit him with the bat? Yeah, but it was an accident. So that made it okay, did it, Owen? It, he didn't do it on purpose. But still yet, Tom got on to him and said, you watch what you're doing, son. So we had to determine, every time one of the kids would come up crying, was it an accident? One time, I think Easton came up crying. You know, Tucker tackled me. Well, what happened? Well, we was playing tackle football. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's pretty much a given. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't a coincidence. It was on purpose. He tackled him on purpose because that was the idea. So we went through that all night long. Was it on purpose? Was it an accident? Was it a coincidence? And all that. When we come to God's Word and we come to Scripture... We look at the blood of Jesus. We talk about the blood of Jesus. We talk about him dying. W was it an accident? Did he, was he at the wrong place at the wrong time in history? W was it a coincidence that, that he ended up hanging on the cross? Or was it on purpose? You see, they didn't take Le Jesus' life. He, he gave his life on purpose. So the question becomes, and I believe we all are on the same page with that. But the question becomes, why? Why did God have to die on the cross? Why, why did he have to do that? It seems crazy. You know, it wasn't an accident. It wasn't a coincidence. It was on purpose. It wasn't like God said, I didn't see that coming. I didn't realize what was going to happen. And, and so we have to, I have to switch from plan A to plan B. You see, a lot of times in our life, we have things happen by accident, by coincidence... And sometimes we, we even do things on purpose, and, and it's because of plan A becomes plan B. But I can tell you the truth. When we look at Scripture and God's Word, we can see that, that Jesus had to die, and He died on purpose. And Jesus died on purpose, not because it was God's plan A, but it was God's plan B, or God's plan B, but it's God's plan A. In verse 16 of Hebrews chapter 9, we kind of see why, why God had to die, why Jesus had to die on the cross. In verse 16, he, Paul, I believe Paul wrote Hebrews. He says, for where there's a testament, there must also, there's also a necessity to be the death of a testator. For a testament is in force after men are, are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Now, when I read that, I was trying to figure out, okay, what, what is God trying to say here? What does Paul want us to understand? He talks about a testament, and the Greek word for testament is actually the, where we get our uh, understanding and our phrase, a last will and testament. In other words, it was a will. It, it was, it's like a will that we write. When you write a will, you, you, you write it on paper, you sign it, you have it documented, you have it authorized, and it becomes legal. It becomes right. It becomes what is going to be followed. And, and, and as I... As I see God's Word, this is God's written Word, but, but it, it was a, it's a document, but it's also the living Word of God. 
And, and it, was, it was written that Jesus had to come and die. And, and so as I look at God's Word, it was a testament. It's like if, if I want my kids to inherit something, I, I put it in writing, or, or any family member, or any friend, or anybody. I, I put it in writing, and guess what happens? I have a living will. I have a last will and testament. And, and our last will and testament says that our, our kids get, and, and they're going to get excited about this, they get everything that we've got when we're gone. They're probably not going to get too excited because there's probably not going to be much there. But, but it's in writing. And guess what? They get nothing until I die. Now, we studied about, you know, before that, that Job's, uh, not Job, excuse me, I'm having a lapse here, about the, the, the lost son. And the lost son, he said, Dad, I just wish you were dead. Uh, you're, you're the same as dead to me, and I want what belongs to me. That wasn't the way it was supposed to work. The father was supposed to die. And, and so the testament of this is that God had to die in order for the testament to have any ability or power or authority. Because the, the testament was, was God's word that it says in verse 17, a testament in force is in force after men are dead. And since it has no power at all, while the testator lives. So in other words, Jesus died because that was God's plan. Jesus died so that the power would be through his death, through the shedding of his blood. And we know, and church, I want you to hear this. Even though the testament was written in scripture that Jesus would bleed and Jesus would die, the scripture also says in God's testament that Jesus would also rise from the dead. And, and, and that happened. And there would be no power in that testament if Jesus had only died and shed his blood. The power in the blood was that Jesus shed his blood, but he has risen from the dead. And that's the power of God. So Jesus intentionally died. Why? Because the, the, the testator had to die in order for the testament to become real. The New Testament is about Jesus. Everything I see in the New Testament is about Christ and his blood. And his death, and his burial, and his resurrection. And, and they were willing to die for the same thing. And they were empowered the same way God wants to empower your life, through, through Jesus. So the death of, of Jesus, the blood sacrifice of Jesus, first of all, it was intentional. The next thing we see from Scripture, the blood sacrifice of Jesus, was also transitional. In, in verse 18, it says, Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. Not, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. The first covenant. What was the first covenant? It was a blood covenant. It was a covenant that we see in verse, uh, verse 19 through 21, and it talks about a time of Moses. You see, Moses was, was God's man. And Moses was the one that was, was called by God to lead the Israelites out of captivity in Egypt. And after they had went out into the wilderness, out into the desert, they were at Mount Sinai, God decided that he would give man, through Moses, the Israelites, his law. The law of God that he would give him. And God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. God gave him his written laws. And so in, in Exodus, we read all about God's laws. And if you ever want to look at how, how God is serious about his laws, you look at the Old Testament, and you read Exodus and Leviticus, and you see that God's very serious about law about the law that he has written for man. And, and so in Exodus, in fact, I believe it's in chapter 23, it begins to talk about Moses. And, and, and when they met at Mount Sinai, there was this cloud that was covering, which was God's presence. And Moses, whenever he had written down all that it was, it was before the, the Ten Commandments was actually delivered to Moses. It was before that that all these commandments were given. And Moses wrote all that down. And then there was a time when Moses was called to call all the people together and he was supposed to come before them with the testament and the covenant that God had made with them and he took blood and, and there was always blood sacrifice involved when it came to a covenant with God. Always blood. And so they would take the blood of animals and they would, they would sacrifice, they would kill these animals and take the blood and then it says what Moses would, would do. He would take uh, the, the wool of a lamb and he would take that and he would sprinkle it on the covenant and he would throw it, cast it out upon the people. Now today if I did that to you, you guys would be like grossed out, wouldn't you? 
I mean, if I, if I killed an animal right here and drained the blood out of that animal and I took that and I took a sponge and I started throwing it at you, you guys would probably run, wouldn't you? At least duck, yeah. And you'd think the preacher's crazy. But that's what they did. In the Old Testament, it was always by the blood. And I tell you what, you, when you read the Old Testament, you realize it was a bloody mess at the sacrifice. And there were times whenever God would, would make the covenant and, and they would honor the covenant and they would make the sacrifices. And there would be hundreds, even thousands of animals that would be sacrificed. And the blood would flow from the altar. And it would just, can you imagine the scene? Can you imagine all the blood that was sacrificed to make that first covenant? Now that first covenant, I can tell you this, was a covering because it also says in Hebrew that all the blood of every animal in the world could not take away one sin. Do you understand that? We could kill every animal in the world at this altar right here today and sacrifice everything and, and throw it upon ourselves. And it still wouldn't take away one sin from the world. They sacrificed because the old covenant was a covering. It was to cover over the sins until the day that Jesus would come and institute the new covenant with his people. And folks, we have to understand it was a transitional point. For them who had sacrificed over and over and over through the blood, it was a transition. All of a sudden, this is a different way of doing things. Just like the preacher gets up, we don't pray right off the bat. You've got to talk and we read scripture and we do this. No. Maybe sometimes there's a new way. And how about this? There has to be a point in our life when God does something new in us. You can try your old ways. You can try your old habits. You can try your old things. And nothing can satisfy, just like the blood of every animal in the world will not satisfy. Nothing will satisfy. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It was a transition. In, in, in verse 19 through 22, or 20, I just want to read that for you. Listen and, and look. It says, There's, Therefore not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept from all the people according to the law, or to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet, wool, hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. And then likewise, and this, this I believe was a time when, when they did build the tabernacle. Moses was given the decree to build a tabernacle, a temporary dwelling for God. And, and so when the tabernacle was built, likewise, he sprinkled it with blood, both the tabernacle and all the vessels of ministry. It was a bloody mess. There was blood scattered at the temple, at the tabernacle. And even when the temple, the temple of God that Solomon built, was consecrated, that covenant in blood. You see, Jesus was making a new covenant. You know, in Luke chapter 22, I want to read this for you. In Luke chapter 22, when Jesus walked here on this earth and Jesus talked on this earth and Jesus taught us all that there was to know about him. In Luke chapter 22, he institutes the Lord's Supper. And guess what? When he does this, there's a change going on. There's a transition going on. No longer was it the old covenant, the old way, the Old Testament. It was something new that God was doing through his son Jesus. He intentionally had to die, but it was a transition. In verse 14, it says in Luke 22, when the hour had come, Jesus, he sat down in the 12 apostles with him. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. In other words, Jesus was observing the Passover supper. Guess what? The Passover was also a blood sacrifice. It was a time before the Israelites were delivered from Egypt. And God told them, you take the blood of a lamb, a firstborn, and you sprinkle it or you spread it over the doorpost of your household. And guess what? When the death angel comes, I will pass by your household. But anyone who does not have that blood of the lamb on the household, the firstborn will die. His blood. They were observing the Passover. Guess what? The Passover would never be looked at the same for those who would believe in Jesus. Who accepted Christ. He became the Passover lamb. And it says here in verse 15, Then he said to them, With fervent desire, I have desire to eat this Passover with, with you before I suffer. He was getting ready to die to shed his blood. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled 
in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and he gave thanks and he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. Guess what? There's enough for everybody. Jesus' blood will cover, will cleanse all man if they will turn to him. It says, for I say to you, I will not drink of this again. And he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In other words, every time you partake, remember this night, remember this day, remember this change, remember this transition that I'm about to enforce, that I'm about to sacrifice with my body. And he goes on and says, do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, in verse 20, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is said for you. He institutes it with blood. Now, the cup and the bread is a symbol of what Jesus was about to do. Just like baptism is a symbol of what's happened in our life, the cup and the bread, it is a symbol. When we take this today, we are not eating the body of Jesus. We're not drinking the blood of Jesus. It symbolizes what Christ has already done for us. And so when we observe this today, we remember the body and the blood that was shed. In verse 21, but behold, the hand of... Excuse me. We'll stop right there. It was a transitional point in history, in all mankind, that no longer did all the sacrifices had to be made. It was transitional. The blood sacrifice of Jesus was not only intentional and transitional, it was also necessary. It was absolutely 100% necessary. The blood of Jesus. You know, whenever I look at my children, I think about when they were growing up and I, I had to discipline my kids. Everybody has to discipline your kids, right? If you don't, what happens to your kids? They turn out a mess, right? We discipline our kids because we love our kids. We don't punish our kids because we hate our kids. It's because we love our children. And then you have grandchildren, and the grandchildren come along, and your children who you've raised, who you've punished, they begin to punish your grandchildren, and you say, that's just not right. I just don't see that in the cards here. And you have to stand back and you have to watch. I have to watch my son discipline my grandsons. And I have to realize, you know, that's exactly what... Now, Now their story is much different than what I believe it is. But, Dad, do you remember how much you beat us when we were kids? <laughs> yeah, right. Those, they look scarred back there, don't they? Yes. But the truth is this. I discipline them because I love them. In the same way, I know that my son loves my grandsons. Why? Because he disciplines them. So, grandparents, it's a hard thing to watch. And for great-grandparents, it's an impossible thing to watch. But the truth is this. It has to be punished. Disobedience, wrongdoing has to be punished. It's necessary in the world and it's necessary with God. The Bible says we've all sinned. We all fall short of God's glory. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ had to be the substitute for our sin. It was necessary. In verse 22, look what it says. In verse 22, it says, And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And listen to this. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. What does that mean? There is no forgiveness. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Without punishment, there is no forgiveness. So by the grace of God and the power of God, Jesus had to have the wrath of God poured upon him so that he could take our punishment, our sin, our transgressions. Folks, we all have it. We've all done it. Some of us are caught in things right now. Some of us are doing things right now. And you're saying, by the blood of Jesus, forgive me. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It was absolutely necessary. The cross of God, and I tell you what, how many of you have watched The Passion of the Christ? I don't know about you, but when I watched The Passion of the Christ, I looked at that, and they beat him, and they beat him, and they beat him, and they took him to the cross, and I was like, enough is enough. Please stop. And God says, but sin has to be punished. Now, in my mind, I can't fathom a God that loves me so much that he would allow his son, himself, his son, to come and die. 
Jesus didn't deserve to die. Jesus died on the cross. Why? It was necessary in order for us to be forgiven. If I want remission of sin, if I want forgiveness of sin, that has to be paid for. I cannot do that. My blood is not good enough. Why? Because it's tainted with sin. Only the blood of Jesus can cleanse me from unrighteousness. In verse 23, it says, Therefore it was necessary that the copies of things in heaven should be purified with these things, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifice than these. In other words... The tabernacle and the temple and any worship place that they had of the Lord was just a copy of things in heaven. In other words, we set up our tabernacles, we set up our temples. The tabernacle is just a copy. The temple was a copy. Jesus was the real thing. And the tabernacle it's talking about here, actually the temple it's talking about here is heaven. Do you realize, now you think about this for just a minute. While we're sitting here worshiping, while we're sitting here paying attention or not paying attention or sitting here not really absorbing what we need to, there is celebration going on in the temple of God in heaven. There are ten thousands of ten thousands of angels that are worshiping Jesus, worshiping God day in, day out. Why? Because what we do, we copy what is going to happen in heaven. Do you think this is a good representation of what happens in heaven? Sometimes I wonder. Because if we understood what was happening in heaven, we would probably be jumping up and down and running up and down the aisles, and then we couldn't be Baptist anymore. We'd have to be Pentecostal. (laughs) You know, I'll probably catch a little Pentecostal blood in me when I get to heaven. I think it was Bob Engel that said he was (laughs) Baptocostal. There's a lot of truth in that. You know, a good mixture, that would be a good thing. Why? Why? Because it is necessary that we understand what's going on in heaven. It is necessary that Jesus came. Why? Because all the blood of the bulls and goats and lambs and sheep and all that that were sacrificed was just an example, just a covering until Jesus could come and he could shed his blood on the cross. Why? For the sins of the world, but before God in heaven on our behalf. The true temple, the true throne room of God where it makes all the difference in the world. The blood sacrifice of Jesus was necessary. I want you to also understand the blood sacrifice of Jesus by Scripture. It was singular. Now, I've said this already many times, but it was once and for all. Once and for all to do away with sin. Verse 24 says, For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands. He, it's, it's, it wasn't man-made which are copies of the true things, but in heaven itself, and now to appear in the presence of God for us. Jesus is our high priest. Did you know that? You don't have to come through a preacher. You don't have to come through a priest. You don't have to go through somebody else that you think is holier than you, because the only high priest that we have is Jesus. Now, you can come to me with your problems. You can come to me with your, your, your victories and your joys. And if you have to, come to me with your complaints. But in the end... You don't have to come before me to come to God. Because we have a high priest that's gone on before us in the presence of God that's at the right hand of God right now. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God making intercession for us as our great high priest. In verse 25, it says, Not that he should offer himself often as a high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. He then would have to suffer often since the foundations of the world, but now once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself once and for all. You see, if the world bought into the plan of God, if the world bought into the plan of Jesus, if they understood that he was the sacrifice once and for all, there would be in that day and any day a lot of high priests that would be out of business. Probably the only thing the priest would be able to do in that day, you know, they would be in the unemployment line. They'd be going in, what's your job qualifications? Well, I go in, I clean my hands, I wash myself, and I kill a bunch of animals. Well, it looks to me like you need to go down to the local butcher shop. Because you no longer need to go in day after day, week after week, year after year, month after month, on and on and on. It is no longer necessary. Why? Because Jesus died once and for all, singular. 
There is no need for another sacrifice. There is no need for more blood. There is no need for anything. Why? Because he is our high priest and he has came to deliver us from sin. Once and for all, to put it away, to die. The last thing, the blood of sacrifice of Jesus. Intentional, transitional, necessary, singular, but finally, and folks, this is where it has to hit home today with you, with me, with anybody here, with anybody listening, with anybody watching. Here's what has to happen. The blood sacrifice of Jesus has to become personal. It has to become personal. You know, one thing I can't understand is why people who are saved by the blood of Jesus hide their faith. How anybody could be truly born again, saved by the blood of Jesus, risen to new life, made a brand new creation, and people say, after knowing you for a long time, I had no idea you were a Christian. I had no idea whether it was intentional or unintentional. How could anybody who has been changed by the blood of Jesus not, not let the world know that? You see, I don't buy into the fact that my Christianity is to be hidden. My Christianity is uh, just between me and God. You know, there is a personal aspect of it, but that personal aspect should challenge me and change me and make me witness to the world. You see, Jesus died in front of the whole world. He didn't hide. He didn't go off in some remote place. He was made a spectacle. He was put out in front of everyone. The whole world was watching. The whole world was betraying him. And Jesus died on the cross between two thieves. Why? Because he shed his blood in a personal way for you. He died in front of the whole world. Have you died in front of the whole world yourself? Is a better question. It says that we take up our cross and we follow him daily. That means where we live, where we work, where we shop, where we play, and, and everywhere that we go, I take up my cross and I am Jesus in this world to someone else. I don't hide it. I'm not ashamed of it. I want the world to know Jesus died out in public and I publicly profess that Jesus is my Lord. Amen? Amen. But you see, Jesus died that public death in front of the whole world. But also, in verses 27 and 28, I want you to see this. Because the personal side of it, it gets very personal at this point in verse 27. When Paul writes this, he says, And it is appointed for men to die once. But after this, the judgment. And verse 28 says, So Christ was offered once to bear sins of many. Those who eagerly await for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. Folks, Jesus is coming back. And he's coming back for the ones who he shed his blood for, who he died for, who he has forgiven. The remission of sin, the shedding of blood. Why? So that we could be with him. You see, in verse 27, it makes it very apparent. It is appointed unto men to die once. That becomes a personal thing. Because why? Because everyone on this earth will face death someday. You know, I heard a... a, a a recount here a while back of uh, just this last week, I was listening to the radio and I heard about the airplane flight that ended up in the Hudson River. You remember that? Back in 2009, it was flight 1549. I wrote that down. U.S. Airways flight 1549. And what had happened was they had taken off on, a, on just a routine flight, I believe to Charlotte, and they took off the runway, and everything was great, and everything was fine. And they took off in the airplane, and all of a sudden they hit a flock of geese. They hit the flock of geese in such a way that it caused the engines to stall, and they lost all forward thrust. And so all of a sudden, the captain comes on the air, and the captain, there's actually a movie out about it now. Uh, let me see if I can find his name. Chelsea Sullenberg, they call him Sully. And I think that's the name of the movie, right, Joe Sully? And it's about the account of the captain and how he... I tell you what, I listened to the, the, the recording and he stayed as calm as a cucumber and he was just like taking everything in and he knew that the, all the life of the 155 people, including himself, was in the hands of him. And they kept saying, well, you can go back to this runway, you can go to this airport, and there's a lot of airports all the way around, but the fact of the matter was this, 155 people on board and their life were inches from being gone 
He decided there was no way that he could make it anywhere out to a runway, and he didn't want to land in the middle of, of a crowded metropolitan area. And he said, the only place I could land was in the Hudson River. As he decided that that was the only thing, the people still didn't know. I was listening to some of the people that were on the plane, and, and this, this woman that was on the plane, and, and she was fearful of flying, and her husband was trying to calm her to begin with, just like I have to do Lisa. And, and so they were on the plane, and, and the guy was an engineer, and he knew from the sounds that something wasn't right. And he knew by the way things were happening, this is not good. But he didn't want to scare his wife, so he just kept telling her, you know, we're going to be okay. We just need to pray. And they prayed. They didn't realize how bad it was until they began to come down, and this lady said, I thought that we were coming back to the airport to land, and then all of a sudden, the look out, and there's water all around and so she realizes we are in dire straits. We are going to die. But she said, I prayed and God gave me a peace that everything was going to be okay. And they prayed and they prayed and the captain just basically said, brace for impact. And the next thing you know, the plane hit the water. And somehow, by God's hand, that plane survived. Somehow, 155 passengers on that plane, every single one of them survived. There were only two that had to go to the hospital for overnight stay. And the pilot was, was, was uh, the captain was, was deemed a hero and they made a movie about him and all this stuff going on. And I thought about this, that airplane, for every practical reason, should have perished along with all those people. And they recounted how their life flashed in front of them, many of them. They realized that I am going to die right at this moment. And I only have seconds before the reality hits that we're going to crash and we're all going to burn, drown, die, and it's over. Many of those people from that aircraft realized that it was the hand of God that saved them. If it wasn't for the grace of God, they give the credit to the captain and all the crew and everything like that. But many of them had to turn to God and say, it was only by God's hand that we were saved. And I want to tell you the truth today. You may think just because you're not in an airplane crash or anything severe like that, that God's hand of protection is not on you right now. Do you know that every moment you live, every day that you live, every second of your life, it is like the airplane is going down and someday we're going to crash and we're going to die. We don't know how, we don't know when. It's out of our hands. We, we don't know when that's going to happen. But the truth is, in verse 27, it is appointed unto man once to die. 155 people should have, could have died that day. Many of them not knowing Christ. Many of them not having the blood of Jesus covering their sins. Many of them perishing forever. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. That blood was shed, but without the application of that, receiving that, there is no forgiveness. And today we play around with their lives. People every day not realizing they are one breath away. One airplane crash away. One moment away from dying. And facing God in eternity. You see, I believe in verse 28, it says so much. In verse 28, it says, So Christ offered once and for all to bear the sins of many, those who are eagerly await for Him. He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. If you're born again by the blood of Jesus, if you have been washed of your sins by Jesus, no other way but by Christ, you can celebrate this today because you have eternal life. It says it is appointed to man once to die, not twice to die. God does not want you to die here on this earth and die and be separated from Him in hell. I heard it said one time, if you live once, you die twice. But if you live twice, you die once. What does that mean? If you live here on this earth and you never accept Christ, you will die, as the Bible says. Why? Because the testament is true. But you will also die a separation from Christ. If you live on this earth physically and you live on this earth by, shed, by the shed blood of Christ, you will die. But then you will face judgment. You will face the judgment seat of God where God will stand before you. You will stand before God. And Jesus will say, my blood is covering the sins of that, that one. They are the ones that I died for. He is the one. She is the one. That is the one. And my blood it was sufficient to pay the price for their sins. 
You see, I believe that we should be eagerly awaiting that. That's what the Bible says. As we observe the Lord's Supper, we remember Christ's death. We remember His blood that He shed. We remember the body that was given. We remember that He was laid in the tomb. We remember that He was there three days. And we remember that Jesus rose again. The question today I have for you is this. Are you ready for that day? Are you ready for the day that Jesus will call you home? We don't know where that home's going to be. It depends on the blood of Christ. And if it's a part of your life. You see, I believe that to be ready, we have to realize the intentional, transitional necessity of a senior way and a personal application to our life. Todd, I want you to come and play something for me. I want you to bow your heads with me for here for just a moment. And I want you to think about what Jesus has just said to you. I want you to think about the fact that Jesus did come. He did die. The blood sacrifice of Jesus is real. See, I believe that if you're not right with God, today's your time. Today's the opportunity. You receive Christ. You accept Christ. And you make Christ your Lord and Savior through His blood. You see, but God could never forgive me. God could never wash away my sins. That's not what the Bible says. That's not what the Testament says. That's not what God's covenant says. He says, I can forgive anything, anywhere, anytime, but you have to give it to me, to Christ, through His blood. If you're right with the Lord, here's what we're going to do. This is the Lord's Supper. This is His invitation. This is His table. We come before this table today, not on our ability not because of this church, but because of the blood of Jesus. If you're not right with the Lord here in just a moment, after we pray, I'm going to ask that you come and you just give whatever it is you need to to God today. Maybe you're not living intentionally enough for God. Maybe you're not understanding that it is a transition. After I accept Christ, my life is supposed to change dramatically. Maybe you need to understand that it's a necessity that I get right with the Lord. That, that, that it's a singular thing, but I need to refresh and renew my walk with the Lord every day. And it needs to become more personal to you than ever before. Are you living for Jesus? Have you accepted Christ? Father, we come before you. We thank you, Lord, for this day. I thank you, Lord, for those who are here. God, I pray those that are listening. Lord, that we would understand that if we do confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that you raised him from the dead, the Bible says in the New Testament that we shall be saved. Lord, if someone needs salvation today, I pray that now would be the time. Today would be the day. Lord, as believers, as we prepare to face this table, it's your invitation, Christ's invitation that we would face that in a worthy manner, that we would examine our lives, that we would come before you, Lord, humbly understanding, Lord, the sacrifice that was given for us in Christ. We will celebrate this today, God, until the day Jesus comes back and until the day of salvation, redemption, comes fully to be glorified in you. Father, we love you and we praise you. Jesus' name.